Good morning, dear saints, and all you others, hello. <laughs> Uncle Fester here again. <laughs> ah, it's raining. It's raining today. Steady rain. Rain is good. Rain is good. Today, we're going to be discussing free grace falling. You'll see the thumbnail, of course. I have been observing. Here they are. I've been over here. I have been observing, observing quite a few of these free grace slash easy believism people and um, I, I, I have and the ones that I have been observing I don't think any one of them is saved not one of them not one of them and see as I have been observing the free grace adherent cannot, will not, I should say, will not outrightly say someone is lost unless it comes to uh, the saints of the Church of the Living God who speak the true message of salvation pertinent for today. Okay? They call us lost, but, you know, if anyone, according to free grace, to easy believism, they are pretty much one and the same pretty much. If anyone at any time ever had a belief in Jesus Christ, in the factual documented proof of the death, burial, and resurrection, well, then they're saved. But as I am observing, uh, a saint saved actually saved person these guys will and <laughs> these women will um label as lost but when someone who is apparently actually lost they's like well they they once believed they're just messed up we'll get more on that in a minute or in a little bit i should say but first Let's establish something. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Please follow me along word for word, verse by verse, the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along. Read with me. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Make sure I'm taking nothing out of context. Read along with me because sometimes the mouth goes quicker than the brain. Okay? This video is kind of a continuation from what we were addressing last week because I, I, I've, I've been observing these people. Like I said, I don't think any one of them is saved. But let's first address something, okay? And a lot of people that I have observed and encountered they will make statements, well, pfft, I'm not going to be that stupid. You know, I don't know that. Okay? So, they're afraid to say, well, that guy's not saved. And they look at us saints who, who have a perfect standard on which we judge ourselves and others. And when we look in the scriptures, it's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay? All right? They don't have that. They don't have that. Even though some of them do use the authorized version of the scripture. But let's establish something. There is no such thing as an impossibility for someone to be saved. We're going to look at this. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 on to verse 26. Like I said, this is kind of a continuation of the two videos that were done last week. Um, this video is not primarily made for you saints, but because we're going to be going over things that you and I already know. But apparently, 
um, some people that are not of us are watching. And granted, five minutes, that's probably, <laughs> what is it, uh, 17 minutes is the most that the people are watching? Whatever, whatever. But let's establish that with God there is nothing that is impossible. Let's establish this first. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 on to verse 26. This is when the rich young ruler came to the Lord, and the Lord, like he does with everybody who uh, goes to him, he puts his finger on that one thing of yours, whatever it is. And he did that with the rich young ruler, because he had a lot of worldly things, and he loved those things more than the Lord, obviously. But, verses 23 and verse 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, kingdom of heaven is always a physical, is there always a reference unto the physical, literal kingdom of heaven in Jerusalem, you know, the physical kingdom. Got to remember that. Okay, we're going to look at this elsewhere within the scriptures, okay? And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Do you see that again? You see the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, one right after the other. Now, there are those out there who will tell you that kingdom of God is actually... No, it isn't. No, it isn't. There are times when it can be a reference onto the kingdom of heaven, but that's decided by context, right? Okay? In this context, we see kingdom of heaven, the actual physical, literal kingdom, and then we see the kingdom of God, which is talking about the spiritual. Okay? And have you ever seen the eye of a needle and you've seen a camel? Okay? The Lord is literally saying it is easier for that huge camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God spiritual. And you see it demonstrated here. This is our instruction in righteousness, obviously. But you see it demonstrated here with the rich young ruler. He went to the Lord and said, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does the Lord say? Why callest thou me good? There's none good but God. See, he was right away addressing the rich young ruler guy who was, just saw a man there, saw a meal ticket, didn't have eyes to see that that was the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Messiah, okay? So the Lord answered him. It's like, well, why are you calling me good? Meaning, you, don't, you can't see, you don't know that I'm your father, that I'm God. Why are you calling me good? <laughs> okay. All right, that's what he meant by that. Verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? If rich people who have the best that life has to offer, if they, then who can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Let's look at uh, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, just two verses. Mark chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. Mark chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. Just reiterating this thing. Um, but let's look. At verses 23 on to verse 27, actually. Okay? And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Okay? Now, hold your place here and go back to Matthew 19. Okay? And let's compare scripture with scripture. Okay? Verse 23 in Matthew 19. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven, the physical literal kingdom. And then here in Mark chapter 10, 
Verse 23, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Two different things he's talking about, obviously. Okay? Two different things. Let's keep reading in Mark chapter 10. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. These are both talking about the spiritual aspect. Okay? That's what the difference is between this and Matthew chapter 19. Okay? Even though both the physical kingdom and the spiritual kingdom are both mentioned, here this is strictly the spiritual. Okay? Let's continue. How hardly, verse, uh, verse 24, excuse me. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You see kingdom of God mentioned three times there. Okay? So people, worldly people, will hardly enter into the kingdom of God spiritual. Okay? Very interesting. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? See, God's a God, a little guy. You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, He has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. Okay? And what does the world call foolish? Us saints. Okay? Atheists. Look at the atheists. They call us stupid. Okay? They believe that they came from, uh, that over millions and billions of years that everything was created by what? Nothing. We believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And they call us the stupid ones. But anyway, verse 27. And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And amen. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Okay, let's look, let's look at some uh, of one of these impossible things. And here's a stumbling block for a lot of the atheists and also a lot of Christians. Just like with a lot of Christians, when you narrow them down to it about the resurrection... Okay, they don't believe in the resurrection. And if Christ isn't raised, then you are still in your sins. If Christ isn't raised, then he's still on a cross. It's not finished. Then you can do something. Can't you? Crazy. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 on to verse 37. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Favor. And what is grace? Grace is basically God's favor. Like I said, grace, uh, a video called Grace and Mercy will be for you in the description box to watch that where we go through this, okay? <clears throat> Let's continue. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And yes, Jesus means Jehovah saves. That's what the name Jesus means. Absolutely. Absolutely. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Okay? And we've discussed this in one of the videos about Jesus Christ is omniscient, omnipresent, and om omnipotent. Okay, despite some senile old farts want you to believe, okay, that will be in the video as well, in the description box as well, okay, well, one moment please, I had to write that down, okay, but let's continue, he shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Son of man, son of God, son of David. Like I said, we discussed those three things in the one video. Um, 
Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. Okay, go ahead and look that up. All right. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, right here, this is a prophecy that is fulfilled within Scripture. Okay? Hold your place and go to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 on to verse 16. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, there's that free will thing again. <laughs> the land that thou abhorrest, shall be forsaken of both her kings. Hmm. Hmm. And also, you go to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 on to verse 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Yes, Jesus Christ is the Father. The Prince of Peace, of the increase of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, that's the prophecy. And here we're seeing it in Luke chapter one. Go back to Luke, okay? Then said Mary unto the angel. How shall this be, seeing I know not the man? Now, the morons, the Mormons say that God the Father actually had physical relations with Mary. That, you know, they're, they're crazy. Stay away from the morons, okay? <laughs> no, no. The miraculous, which is something that the atheist doesn't believe in, Okay? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Yes, it's not uh, uh, Yeshua ben Joseph. No, it isn't. Jesus, the son of Joseph. No, it isn't. Joseph was not the father of Jesus. He wasn't. Okay? He wasn't. So a lot of Hebrews believe that. They refer to Yeshua ben Yosef. Okay? So. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. Verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. So the Lord, without any physicality, within Mary, <laughs> made her with child, without any physicality, okay? Without any of it. It was miraculous, the virgin birth, okay? That's impossible. Atheists, you yourselves will say that that can't happen. You know, that can't happen. A woman cannot be with child without, without a man, right? Sure did. It happened. It sure did. And of course, the atheists don't believe that because they are their own God. But see, the impossible is possible with God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We see a similarity here. A similarity. Okay? But we are concentrating on how God is the God of the impossible. Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Genesis 18 verses 9 on to verse 15. 
Now, this is the three visitors, which is not the Trinity, you devils. Okay? One is a precarnate form of Jesus Christ. One is God in the flesh, right here. All right? And the other two are angels. All right? It's not the Trinity, you devils. Okay? And they come to Abraham and Sarah. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Yes, her flowers ceased. Okay? Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I am old? Verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. <laughs> no. Brethren, we mustn't be afraid of that fact. Okay? Yes, the devils use that totally in a wicked way to justify themselves and their sins. Absolutely, they do. But the fact is, nothing is impossible with God. Okay? Nothing is impossible with God. It really isn't. We mustn't fear that fact. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And of course, Isaac. Isaac was the promised son there. And in Isaac shall thy seed be called, not in Ishmael. Okay? All right? Now, go to Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32, we want verses 26 on to 35. Now, this is talking about land grant kind of stuff, uh, property, and the return from captivity is also weaved into this. But what we are looking at this for, nothing is impossible for, with God. Okay? God, who made a woman with child, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. Okay? All right. <laughs> he made Abraham and Sarah. To, um, he made Sarah to be with child from Abraham. Okay? The impossible is possible with God. It really is. It really is. And see, devils like to do things, you know, like uh, devil, the devil's temptation of Jesus. It's like, if you be the Son of God, cast yourself off of the temple. It's like, no, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Okay? Okay? But when it comes to, for example, salvation, the impossible is possible with God. Don't get ahead of me yet. I feel you, brethren. Don't get ahead of me yet. We already kind of discussed this in the previous video about the free will thing. Don't get ahead of me. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 26 on to verse 35. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Hmm. Is there anything too hard for me? No. The Lord could cure your cancer just like that if he wanted to. Why doesn't he? I don't know. I don't know. You read in the book of Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones. He brought the bones together and brought them back to life. Okay? 
He can bring back people to life. He can create life. Okay? He is God. All right? Nothing is impossible for God. This is truth. This is fact. But see, there's that thing called free will. We're talking in the salvific sense now. There's that thing called free will, which we discussed quite thoroughly in the previous video, which will be in the description box for you. And the Lord is not going to circumvent free will, Mr. Calvinist. Okay? But let's continue. Verse 28. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against the city shall come and set fire on the city and burn it with the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and poured out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done, pay attention to this, evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. Ah. So, nothing is impossible for the Lord. But the Lord, who is righteous, fair, is not going to impose, not going to impose against the free will that he has given unto mankind. Okay? you got to remember that. This is what makes Calvinism so deadly. Okay? Let's continue. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. For this city hath been to me as a provocation of mine anger and of my fury from the day that they built it, even unto this day, that I should remove it from before my face. Because, uh, because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned unto me the back, and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, Yet they, have, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. See, again, the thing of free will. There's no force involved. Okay? God does not force salvation. Satan does not force unsalvation, if you will. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Okay? He has given unto man free will. It's ludicrous that people think that the scripture doesn't isn't about free will. It's it's ridiculous. It's it's stupid. It's stupid. It's weaved with from Genesis on to Revelation. Free will. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. They, they made the choice to go against God. Okay? And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So nothing is too hard for the Lord. Absolutely not. But! That thing about free will again. Okay? That thing about free will. He created you for fellowship. He created you so you and he could have a relationship. He did. Why did he create you? Because he wanted to. Read Revelation chapter 4. Okay? Verse 11, I believe it is specifically. One of the brethren will correct me on that, I, I trust, okay, if I'm wrong. But um, God created you because he wanted to. 
There are no oopsies. You, your father and your mother might not have had you on their radar, but the Lord did. Okay? The Lord did. There are no oopsies. There are no oopsies when it comes to God. Okay? But there again, God is not going to violate free will. He wants you to make the right choice. He wants you to choose him. He does. He gives you the free will. And because he gives you the free will, he is just as equally angry with every right for you, his creation, to give unto the devil, which is rightly due unto him as your creator. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Again, we, we are touching this thing about the free will because it, it, it's... it's Incredible. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, I marvel that people will try to tell you, well, the scriptures doesn't teach free will. You, you obviously don't read the scriptures. <laughs> because it's throughout. Free will is throughout. Okay? It is. To try to for people to say that free will is absent in Scripture, that God is against free will, that's a stupid statement. That's that's stupidity. That really is. Now you might not know and be ignorant and want to know. Fine, but if you are willfully ignorant, that's stupid. And to say that God is against free will, that's stupid. That is stupid. Deuteronomy 32, verses 28, on to verse 33. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. And we see in Scripture, understanding is likened unto what? Departing from evil. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, them free gracers. <laughs> Easy believism devils. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, that they were wise, wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Hmm. The impossible is possible with God. Yes, it is. But see, God is not going to violate your choice. He, he will violate you for making the wrong choice. Absolutely. <laughs> he will. Yes, he will. But he will not violate your choosing. He won't. We're looking at it again. This is imperative. This is imperative. Okay? This is a, this is a nuts and bolts thing for you to understand. Not talking to you saints, because you get it. Okay? God isn't twisting your arm. Satan is not twisting in your, your arm. His salvation is there. But you've got to go the way he prescribed. And that's what these free grace people don't do. They don't go the way he prescribed. More on that in a little bit. But let's continue. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? What are we reading on to? Um, what are we reading on, on to verse 33? Okay. How should one chase how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their capital our rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? For their lowercase r rock is not as our capital R rock. Okay? Can you see that? Can you see that? Alright. Their rock isn't God. Our rock is God. Okay? Even our enemies themselves being judges. I know of uh, several devils, one in particular, who actually does know what true saints look like. And it baffles me. It's like, dude, how can you tolerate the people that you're looming around? I, I don't understand that. Well, I do. You're not saved yourself. But, I mean... 
there are devils out there who can spot the real thing because the, the spirit of the Lord, you know, the Lord himself lives within us. And the devils recognize that just like that. Okay, they can see that. But when you got someone who's putting on an adornment of religiosity, of Christianity, they can also spot that too. And also too, when someone's little R rock <laughs> is the one motivating them, moving them, i.e. their father, the devil, Satan, it also shows, okay? We saints can obviously see that. And so can a lot of you atheists. And see, that's Satan's goal. To make the faith that was once delivered unto the saints look abhorrent unto you by what you see in people who are not saved. And the ones that are not saved are usually the ones that you are encountering. Especially on like social media platforms, you know. Not all. There are saved brethren uh, on uh, on this platform and on others, yes, there are, but you got to look for them. You got to know what you're looking for. Otherwise, you're going to run into Calvinists or the Free Gracers or Catholics or whatever, okay? But let's continue. For their vine, right here, here's the shout out to Rome Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, okay? Remember, it began in Babylon. It was crafted, with every pun intended, in Egypt. It was perfected in Rome. Okay? The Babylonian religion, which is Roman Catholicism. Perfected. Okay? It's the Babylonian religion perfected. Okay? I'm, I'm writing that down uh, so for a link in the description box. Break your pardon, okay? For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And their fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. I like that verse because the wine that Rome offers you, and there's the, a reference onto dragons, devils. Dragon, the, dra the red dragon, the devil, you know, in Revelation. Leviathan. You know, talks about that. All right? So, when one chooses contrary to the Lord, hmm, nothing is impossible for God. But when you choose contrary, when you choose contrary, when you choose yourself, see, then the wrath of God is upon you. The wrath of God is upon you. God's love can be found at the cross. But you got to go the way he said. Broken, contrite, and in fear of him, call upon his name. Okay? All right? And if he saves you, you're sealed until the day of redemption. And I say if he saves you, because God does know your heart. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And he knows if you are truly broken. And that's the thing. You need to be broken. And that's what the free gracer doesn't like. They don't like that at all. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. I'd love to do a expository on this one. Psalm 78, verses 40 and 41. And verse 40 is the turning point in Psalm 78 just so you know. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How can man limit God who is the God of the impossible? God is not going to force salvation on you. And when you doubt the Lord, when you lightly esteem the word, Brother Alexander Hartley did a phenomenal, the Lord gave him a phenomenal video to do yesterday on um, lightly esteeming the word of God, of despising the word. That will be in the description box as well. Mm -hmm. Magnificent, praise the Lord for it, okay? But see, 
When you are denying the truth, when you are denying the Lord, when you are denying what is said here, Okay, God is the God of, of impossibilities. Yes, he is. But see, you are limiting the Lord because you don't see him as God, like the rich young ruler. Most of you don't even see him as anything except a construct of imagination, right? <laughs> right, you do. So hence, you are limiting God. Does that make sense? You, man cannot do anything to God. But see, if you're not going to believe on him, if you're not going to love him, if you're not going to believe the record that he gave of his son, his wrath is for you. And as we covered in the previous video, you choose contrary to the Lord, oh boy, oh boy, he'll give you whatever you he'll, he'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. Psalm 81, verses 8 on to verse 16. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if... You know, when you come to an if in Scripture, you should take your pen and circle it, because if is a conditional clause. Okay. If thou wilt hearken unto me, there shall no strange God be in thee, Neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Okay? But, but, my people would not hearken to my voice. Free will. And Israel would none of me. Free will. So, I gave them up unto their own heart's lusts. Excuse me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, And they walked in their own counsels. There again. You don't want the truth. The Lord will oblige you. He's giving like that, you know. You don't want the truth. You want to believe a lie that you can save yourself by your belief. Very similar to the metaphysical mind science teaching of Mary Baker Eddy, of the name it and claim it people. Okay? You are, these, they have faith in their faith. And you know, it's very evident. It's very evident. That their faith is in their faith. Their faith is in their belief. Not on a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, they say so. Oh, they sure do say so. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. More on that in a bit. Let's continue. Okay? Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I, so, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, and with honey out of the rock, Lord Kesar, should I have satisfied. But see, you choose contrary to the Lord. Then you get that which decays. It's not worth it. <laughs> it isn't worth it at all, man. Matthew 23. Just one verse. Matthew 23. We want verse 37. Oh, excuse me. 37 on to verse 38. Let's read that, a little context. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Like it says, I believe it's in Amos chapter 5, they hate him, they despise him that rebuketh in the gate. 
How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not. Free will. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And ye would not. Like I said, it's very funny to me that with a lot of the free gracers that I am observing, um, they have this reluctance to call anyone, like the obvious candidates that are not saved, you know, uh, lost. But yet, at some time in their life, they profess the belief in Christ. And because of their silly doctrine of them saving themselves through their belief, then they have to do some pretty interesting gymnastics. They really do. Well, hey, like, for example, like I've already said, I think, Christy Burke, stupid head, okay? At one time, she professed to believe on Jesus Christ. She even says so herself. The true God of the scriptures? No, absolutely not. No, that, that, that stupid head was never saved. But the free gracer, easy believism guy will come along. It's like, well, well, she did say that she believed. And hence, once you believe, you're eternally secure, right? Eternal security. Amen. 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 To eternal security. Amen. But see, Christy Burke was never saved. And the free will adherent has to, in order to protect their doctrine, say, well, yeah, she's just saved, but she's messed up. I've listened to that little devil quite a bit. That, that girl, well, she was never saved. She was never saved. But see, the easy believism heretic, the free grace adherent, in order to protect their salvation by saving themselves by their belief, they have to say, well, she's saved. Cause she, hey, if she believed, she was saved. I don't know her heart. <laughs> um, I, I think if you've watched anything by a little stupid head, um, I think you could say readily after watching a couple of her videos, giving her about five hours of your time, uh, yeah, uh, out, of the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That, that, that little stupid head, she was never saved. But like I said, the easy believism heretic, the free grace adherent will be like, well, I, I can't, I can't. I don't know her heart. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? See, they're missing some ingredients that are necessary to true scriptural salvation. They are. And if you're missing, say, the two ingredients, you're missing them all. More on that in a second. Acts chapter 13, verses 44 on to verse 46. This is very interesting. Check this out. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Okay? Look at what Paul and Barnabas do here. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Greek is a Gentile, okay? I love, I love this. Look at this. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Look at that verse. 
judge yourselves unworthy because they were preaching the resurrection. Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. The shed blood for the remission of sins. Okay? The death, burial. They were preaching Jesus Christ, the resurrection. Okay? And these Jews, which were contradicting and blaspheming, judged themselves unworthy. <laughs> Let that roll around in your head a little bit. Seriously. Let that roll around in your head a little bit. Think about that. Chew on that for a little while. See, we have a perfect standard on which we judge ourselves and others. But when you come around only giving judgment on the true and you call the truth False. Hmm. Hmm. But yet, you make statements, well, I, I kind of already said I don't think they're saved, but I'm not going to, that's stupid. I don't know their heart. No, you're stupid, pal. <laughs> There's no nice way to put that. You're the stupid one. Because we have a perfect standard where we judge ourselves and that we are to judge others. Again, this all comes back to judging. Which the false convert, the free gracer, uh, the easy believism heretic, they have a big problem with judgment. Oh, they'll judge us saints, of course. But, you know, the devil knows his own. Matthew chapter 7. Oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 now on to verse 19. Verses 15 on verse 19. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 on to verse 19, if my fingers will work with me. Okay. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, a lot of these devils can mimic good fruit, but see the consistency. And we all make mistakes. I sin every single day. Okay, I, I make mistakes. There are times when I act like a hypocrite. There are times when I am a hypocrite. There are times when I act foolishly. Speak foolishly, absolutely. But there again, that comes into the thing with chastisement, which we're going to touch on. Okay, these guys can mimic certain of these works. Absolutely. The works of repentance, if you will. The works that you are supposed to put forth, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out, out the Lord in you. You are supposed to work that out. Live according to the scriptures. We all make mistakes. We all sin every day. And that's the thing that the easy believism heretic, the free gracer, likes to hinge on. It's like, well, they just could be making a mistake. Where's the chastisement? Well, we can't see chastisement. In someone who isn't saved, you're not going to see chastisement. No. But in saints, when the Lord chasteneth, the outward effect of the chastening of the Lord will be visible. More than that in a bit. Okay? But now those of you who may have watched a couple of videos like, well, hey, Brad. You said that this is not doctrine for us today in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, right? That's not doctrine for us today. Well, this is instruction in righteousness, but you're right. Doctrinally, it is not for us today. You are right. Instruction in righteousness, yes. Doctrine, no. You're right. You want, you want the uh, doctrinal equivalent, equivalent for us today in the Pauline epistles? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Okay? 
1 Corinthians chapter 4. We want verses 18 on to verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 on to verse 21. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God, spiritual, is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? Power. Who is the source of our power? As saints. The Lord lives within us. He is our power. Okay? He, the Lord, He is our all. He is our life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. He is the resurrection. He is our redemption. Okay? He is our salvation. He, <laughs> He got me up this morning. He got my wife up this morning. He is our all. Okay? He dwells within me. And if you're a saint, saved, He dwells within you. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verses 1 on verse 8. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you, as if I were present the second time, and being absent. Now I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God for a Jew. See, Paul right there is saying the power that is in us is of God. It's not of us. It is of God. And see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul is talking about, you know, those who are puffed up, I will know the power, not the word. A lot of these guys that I've been observing, they can say good things. They, can, they use all kinds of fancy rhetoric. Uh, theological terms, I despise that word theology, but they use all these terms, but yet they make little slips, okay? I have heard these free grace people use profanity. Again, we make mistakes, but see, a saint who utters profanity, right away, brethren, we're like, Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry that I'm sorry that evil speaking came out of my mouth. Forgive me, Lord. And that publicly? And I have seen with these free grace people, they count it as nothing. You can see it in the, the comment sections. And they're they say, well, I believe in Jesus. I'm uh, I'm once saved, always saved. Oh. How 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 are you saved? By Romans 3, 23 on verse 26. <laughs> okay. Paul is addressing here that a lot of people can sound good. A lot of people could put on a, a facade and a religious shoe. But see, the power in them, the Lord in you, the hope of glory, that's what isn't evident in, I believe, every single one of these free grace individuals that I have been observing. I don't think any one of them are saved. I don't. I really don't. I really don't. 
Let's continue here. Examine yourselves. Right there. Right there. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you? Except ye be reprobate. See, if you don't have Jesus Christ in you, you're reprobate. Okay? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as repro reprobates. Reprobates on the who? The world. Christianity. And a lot of the false converts. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And then go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this we see a lot of today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 on to verse 7. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Denying the power thereof. What is our power as saints? It's the Lord himself who dwells within the saved, born again believer, a new creature. You are a new creature because the Lord dwells within you. That is what makes you a new creature. Okay? For of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. And here I see, I've, I see, I've observed so much of this with these people. It's kind of disgusting. Ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Why? Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Unto the pure, all things are pure. See, saints have a heart that belongs unto the Lord, which the Lord calls a pure heart. Now, man's heart, we're going to look at that. But see, when you come to the Lord on his terms, broken of your self-righteousness, contrite, taking responsibility that you put him on the cross, and fear him, and call upon his name, and he saves you. Okay? All right? All right? Hence, in salvation, through brokenness and contrition and fear of the Lord, which happens in one fell swoop, by the way. You say, you brethren, you know that. You others, you don't, you can't understand that. Okay? In the sight of the Lord, that's a pure heart, even though our hearts are wicked. Okay? All right? A pure heart is a heart that belongs to the Lord. Okay? More on that in a second. But unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. This is pure. The authorized version of the scriptures. Do you, do you despise the word? Well, the King James is the best we got, but it's not perfect. You're despising the word. Nothing. What's pure to you? What's pure to you? Hmm? What's pure to you? Yourself. Yourself. You are your own standard. Hmm. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. I give. I donate to whatever. I, I give homeless people stuff. I do this. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you do. Catholics do that too. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sure with the free grace people, it's like, what about Catholics? Well, if they believe Catholics. I don't believe there is one saved Catholic at all. You're Catholic. You, you don't even know if you're going to go to heaven when you die. Okay? You, you, your Jesus is in you for 15 minutes in your stomach. Okay? There is no such thing as a saved Catholic. Okay? There are those that come out of Catholicism and become saints, saved people, yes, but there isn't a saved Catholic. There isn't. There really isn't. Okay? Okay? 
They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Reprobate. Hmm. There's that word again. Now, this thing about the good works, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, on to verse 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, works of the law. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, a new creature, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 2. Okay? <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who are you proving that to? As ambassadors for Christ. As ambassadors for Christ, the world. And those who will observe. And those who will see your testimony. Okay? Why is it then these free grace people who are rampant with profanity and yet produce and put things to you in a worldly way? Because they speak of the world. Because they are of the world. Therefore the world heareth them. Okay? All right? And they're so ah, about judging. But yet, like I said, when it comes to the saints, they'll judge us like that. Don't you? But see, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul was someone who judged whether or not people were saved or not. Oh, I can hear you. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, we have already looked that the power that is in the saved believer is the Lord Himself. Okay? Okay? All right? But what is Paul saying here? For I determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What is this talking about? Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verses 20 on to verse 21. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Ah, a clue. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're not supposed to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Okay? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Hmm. So, Christ in you. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What this means there, Jack, that Paul is determined to see who was actually saved. That's what that means. Paul wanted to see, okay, who here is crucified with Christ. Who is saved? That's what he's talking about. Paul judged other people's salvation. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But see, the easy believe is a heretic. Amongst their own, you know, the worldly, you know, devils and whatnot, they won't. Well, hey, they once believed. They can just be backslidden, right? About that! Chastening 
Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The argument is, well, we don't know how the Lord is chastising people. That is partially correct. But see, what is the result of God's chastisement within a saint? That's the thing. That's the thing. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, on to verse 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Oh, he has to receive you because all of a sudden you're walking all, all along. And it's like, okay, I guess I'll believe the facts. I guess I'm saved now because I just believed. You, you, you know, I think Jeffrey Dahmer's in heaven. You do? Yeah. You think he's in heaven and you think I'm lost? Yeah, I do. I'm better than Dahmer. And that's the thing with you free grace people. Every single time, and this is easy to draw out in you, very easy, Sooner or later, it comes down to you, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as so and so. Every single one of you that I have ever encountered, that I have ever had converse with, every single one of you, every single one, I'm not as bad as so and so. I'm not that bad. See, that gives you away. That is a lack of brokenness. But, chastisement. Okay? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father, that's the lowercase f there, chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, not sons. Hmm. Who's answering the prayer, by the way? Who's answering their prayers? Okay. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the capital S uh, capital F, excuse me, Father of spirits and live. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit. That we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, and here it is, here it is, here it is, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That peaceable fruit of righteousness, his righteousness, is demonstrated by we saints as ambassadors for Christ. So hence, a saint in chastisement, the actual process of the chastising, no, we don't see. But afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which is observable and evident in the saved saint. I've seen this with brethren. A, a, a dear, uh, beloved brother of mine, ours, recently went through some chastisement, going through uh, chades, as it were. And he took measures to get out of something. And now, after the, all the chastisement, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which I am able to behold. Okay? See, the chastising, the actual 
moments itself usually is not visible unless it's, you know, a chastisement that's so obvious that like you're walking into a door or something, you know, but you don't actually see the process. But in saints, that chastisement yields what? The peaceable fruit of righteousness. His righteousness, not self-righteousness. His righteousness. Okay? Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Let's read verse on to verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Okay? See, the chastisement that comes upon us Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness, which can be beheld by others. Okay? And see, if you don't have chastisement of the Lord, where is that peaceable fruit of righteousness? It's not there. It's not there. And Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, okay? <laughs> And a lot of, now you got to remember, there are some free gracers out there who do know the scriptures. Um, uh, uh, these free gracers too are these ones who are notorious for, it's uh, by grace through faith from Genesis on to Revelation. Leave those people alone. If, they, if they're ignorant, don't know better, don't know about rightly dividing the word of truth and you inform them and they're like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, they saw God in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, it was works. Oh, that was kind of silly of me. But that's not what happens with the free grace people usually. They will defend that, well, it was by grace through faith in the Garden of Eden. That's willful ignorance. That's stupid. Okay? I harp to that because they say, I've seen it. I've observed it. I've heard it from these guys. That it was by grace through faith in the Garden of Eden. And that's the most obvious of them all to show anyone it's like, that they, it's not the same as it is today. Anyone atheists Muslims have even noticed that and yet the free grace Christian doesn't like I told you Satan has set up his ministers of righteousness and no marvel that his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness who's righteousness by the way and see that's the thing it's your righteousness because you saved yourself by your belief. Okay? But Romans chapter 6, verses 19 on to verse 23. Again, yielding the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Romans 6. There is an expository on Romans 6 that was done a couple years ago. Um, that will be in the description box. Verses 19 on to 23. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. All flesh is sinful. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity. Hey, atheists, you got something that ain't the scripture, right? It says slave there, doesn't it? It does. Not in all of them, sure. But they like to take out servant and put slave. Slave doesn't have free will. <laughs> okay? Verse 19 right here. Choice. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded by your choice your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members choice servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants, not slaves of sin, ye were free from righteousness. 
his righteousness. Okay? What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Worldly sorrow produces death. The Philippian jailer, they, they love the Philippian jailer because they say, well, he didn't repent. Uh, he was about to kill himself. That, he, that was worldly sorrow. Uh, have you read 2 Corinthians chapter 7? It says worldly sorrow causes death. Hold your place here. Hold your place here. Let's go there. Okay. Um, if the Philippian jailer had worldly sorrow only, like they like to tell you, to avoid scriptural repentance, um, he would have succeeded in uh, committing <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay? He would have. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow, and remember, again, the free gracer will, will imply to you that godly sorrow is a straight edge razor. Godly sorrow is a double edged sword. Okay? Double edged. Two ways, not just one, like they like to imply to you. See, they do all these kinds of gymnastics to avoid personal accountability. They do. They do. And it is exhibited in their behavior. Okay? Especially the one that I've been observing the most. And I'm bad. That, that guy's like, woohoo, you stay there. You, one of the most conceited um, guy who wants to be in the spotlight, a pompous, uh, just amazing how um, glory hungry some of these guys are. But verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. If the Philippian jailer had worldly sorrow, he would have killed himself. Okay? He had godly sorrow. Okay? There's a difference. See, and that's something, again, that the easy believism, free grace heretic, okay, that's what they harp to. Why? To avoid brokenness contrition, and the fear of the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, if you're not broken and you have no contrition, how in the wide world of sports entertainment could you ever fear the Lord? How? Explain it to me. Explain. I, I my, my one relative he, who's a Catholic is like, well, everybody fears the Lord. It's like, oh yeah? Then how come I heard you uh, use his name in vain? Hmm? How come you're letting your children dress like whores? Huh? Huh? Yeah, don't you, don't, don't you tell me you, you fear the Lord. You lying at heathen. Okay? You don't. You don't. Okay? But, let's go back to Romans 6. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And see, chastisement in the saint yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which can be observed by fellow saints and also by others. You don't see the actual process. You don't see the actual actual hammer in the hand of the Lord smacking them. But you can see the outcome of it. I, I've seen that in my brethren, in my sisters, in my wife. She's seen it in me. Okay? All right? But now, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Unto the free grace adherent, this is what they call the pure gospel, like the Inquisitor from New York says. And they primarily, they vary in this, but this is where they primarily go. For all have sinned, and come, uh, verses 23 on to verse 26. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? See, we're all sinners. Yes, you're right. Everyone's a sinner. 
What about you? Well, we're all sinners. But see, you can use that. This is truth. This is absolute truth. Yes, it is. But see, what happens is the easy believism, free grace comes all, guy comes along, says, just believe. You're all sinners. That person doesn't, that means that person doesn't have to take account of their own sin, but can hide under that umbrella. Well, we're all sinners. Very clever what they do. Okay? Being justified freely by, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Amen? To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Amen? But see, there's something that they're leaving out. See, when you come to somebody with this alone, avoiding brokenness of your self-righteousness, accountability, contrition, and the fear of the Lord, and you've just come to them with just believe and come to hear, you're missing, you're missing it. Paul, now see, the truth is, and that is absolute truth. Amen, amen. We mustn't be afraid of Romans chapter 3, brethren, because the devils have found a way to manipulate it into a false doctrine. Okay? All right? The scripture is true, but the free grace devil comes to that and tries to turn the word of God into a lie. See? They're the ones that are twisting scripture. Okay? They are the ones. See, Romans chapter 1 is about you. It's about you, lost person. It's about you, atheist. It's about me when I was lost. Same with Romans chapter 2. It's about you. Should have seen, I, I've given scriptures away. And it's like, oh, where should I read? I'll start in Romans. Because it's about you. And you should have seen, you should see someone who looks like it. It's about me. It's like, yeah, it's about you. It's about you personally. And that's what the free grace adherent avoids. That's what they avoid. Well, we're all sinners. But see, Romans 1, 2, and Romans 3 up to verse 18. We've talked about this before, saints. But, you know, this isn't really primarily for you. But up to verse 18, it's all one thing you lack. It's the Lord putting his finger on that thing. It's him pleading his indictment against you. Okay? So when the free gracer comes to Romans 3 and quotes, they, they, they vary from where they quote, but it always encompasses verses 23 and at least on to verse 26. And see, in context, when you come to someone, see, when the Lord uses you to guide someone onto himself through the Romans road, okay? All right? You, the Lord shows them their condition through Romans 1, 2, and 3, up to verse 18. And then, I've seen this. It's like, well, I can do better. I can do something. Hence, doing something like a work, going to the law. And then Paul brings up, it's like, no, no. Now we know that what so, now we know, verse 19, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, Paul is giving the solution to the problem in Romans 3. Okay? He's giving the solution in comparison to the law. Because when a lost person gets to this point and you see it, 
you can see the the gears going. It's like, okay, well, what what is there some kind of thing that like is there for an example, what what peanut do I need to push up a hill to get right with God? It's like, well, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And I've seen this. It's like, well, well, dude, you're telling. Wait, wait, wait. But now, the righteousness of God without the law. Because it's like, what? But I've I've encountered this. Okay, you free gracers, you have not. Obviously, it's like, well, wait a minute. If I go on the law, doesn't that mean I gotta do the thing on Saturday and stay away from pork? No, that's a different dispensation. A what? Don't worry about it. Okay, keep keep with me. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Okay. This is what the easy believism heretic, the free grace adherent, avoids. Hence, not dealing with their self-righteousness. Because like I said, every single solitary, every single one that I have ever encountered always comes around, I'm better than that. Every single one, every single time. Sometimes it takes a little while, but it usually you can get it out of you can get that out of them pretty quick, very quick. Okay, you can. Why? Because they're not their self righteousness. Okay, their accountability. Well, we're all sinners, and see Romans one, two, and three are about your accountability to God. And that's what they avoid. And if you have not been broken of your self-righteousness, and you are, well, the woman that you gave me to be with, she gave me the tree and I did eat. Not taking accountability, not having contrition, godly sorrow. Listen, if you are not broken of your self-righteousness and you have no godly sorrow, how could you fear the Lord Okay. Now, granted, when the Lord during the time of Jacob's trouble, well, you know, people will fear the Lord. But unto salvation, okay, unto salvation here, we're talking. How are you supposed to fear the Lord and call upon His name if you have no brokenness or contrition, but just go straight to believe? And I've encountered with atheists, you know, <laughs> it's like. You know, these Christians, they act just like we do. But, you know, we're, well, we're saved by our own belief. See, they are saving themselves. And they come to here to justify it. And see, this is the solution to the problem of the sinner who is brought to brokenness and contrition. And see, and in Romans chapter 4, he goes on to explain. And as I have told you, and see, you free gracers, you don't understand this. Because she's like, just believe and receive. What about repentance? It's going from unbelief to belief. <laughs> you know five is the number of death, is associated with death in the scripture? By the time you get to Romans 5 with somebody, death you're going to see what you are dealing with. I can guarantee you. If the Lord opens up an opportunity and you got some time and you got the scriptures and you're talking with them, you know, and remember when you're talking with these people, make sure you're shoulder to shoulder and you're doing this with them. Okay, you make sure you do that if you get the chance. It's rare. It will happen. It can happen. But when you do, you get, you know, don't be afraid. It's like, see that? And read it with your finger, with the pointer. And it's like, hey, see that? Show it to them. Okay? Show it to them. That works. Okay? But by chapter 5, 
you're going to know whether or not that person is going to be receptive to hear more or they stonewall. You're going to know. Okay? And repentance is going from unbelief to belief. Now, the free gracer is already aware of this verse and just when you say that to a free gracer, what you do is you sit back in your chair, put your feet up, and just watch the show of their gymnastics to how to get around. And it always involves, not rightly dividing the word of truth too, by the way, <laughs> but it always involves gymnastics when you bring them to a specific verse in James. You should see them. They're prepared for it. But the gymnastics they go to, to try to explain verse 19 in James 2, okay? Well, repentance is going from unbelief to belief. Thou believest that there is one God. And see, a lot of the free gracers are Trinitarians. You believe in three gods. Yes, you do. Shut up. You do believe in three gods. One Plus one, plus one, brute is three. Muslims, atheists, your right to attack the... Your right to attack the Trinity. The Trinity is of Satan, it is of the devil. Okay? Atheists, remember, you're, you're made in the image of God, you have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. Okay? All right? But the, you, you don't believe in one God. You believe in three gods. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I know there are some fancy schmancy mathematical equations. Uh, a dear brother brought that up to me one time who's really good at numbers. Uh, he brought that up. Well, there is an equation. It's like, well, I didn't know that, brother. Thank you. But in regards to the Trinity, okay, three make one? No. But thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And like I said, like I said, the gymnastics, when you present, and they're ready for it. They're the, they, to their credit, they're ready for it. They're ready for it. But the thing about repent, okay? Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at some first occurrence. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 on to verse 8. And atheists love this one too. And so do some Christians. Who's like, well, repentance is a work. Uh, prayer is a work. Watch out, because a lot of those guys too, not all of them, a lot of them will say, well, prayer is a work. You know, you just, you know. <laughs> oh, I believe. I'm saved. Just thought. But yet we're told to call upon the name of the Lord. And they get really cute. It's like, well, what if they can't call on them? They, like I said, the gymnastics that these guys go to to defend their heretical doctrine is pretty, like I said, I mean, and don't, don't, don't even try with some of these guys who think they know something. Just get, get your feet up, sit back, get, get yourself a water or a glass of milk or something, and just sit there and watch them and be like, wow, you should be in the Olympics with all the gymnastics you're doing. It's, an, it's, it's quite wonderful to behold, full of wonder. It's like, wow, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't know a man could bend that way. <laughs> but Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 on verse 8. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Fallen man. Has this gotten better with time, atheists? Well, of course, the atheists, well, we're evolving into a more better people and whatnot by calling evil good and good evil. Well, it's not evil unto us. I know that because you're, you're a little devil yourself. Yes, I know that. But uh, God calls it evil. Well, we don't believe in God. I know you believe in yourselves. Okay, this is a no-win uh, conversation for us, unfortunately, for, with some of you. I, I, I realize that. But this, this has gotten worse with time. Second law of thermodynamics, everything goes down 
with time, mankind is not getting better. Genius, okay? But, and it repented the Lord. Now, hey, hey, hey. Now, atheists, well, God was a sinner. And even Christians, God was a sinner that he needed to repent. Shut up. Now, pay attention and look at this verse. Look at this verse. Look at it. Listen. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. This is the first appearance of repent in any variation, by the way. It's right here. Okay? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So, first appearance of any variation of repent. What do we see associated with it? We see that word grieved. There's grief involved in repenting. And the gospel as the free grace, easy believism devil presents it. There's no grief at all. Is there? Going from unbelief to belief. There's no grief. It's all good, right? Believe and receive. But in Romans, you read that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That they're all out of the way. Everyone is filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That includes you. That includes me. And that's there purposely to break you of your self-righteousness that you're not a good person. Uh, but they, they don't want to discuss that. But they, they will, I've seen it, but it's, it's laughable because they always go under the umbrella, well, we're all sinners. They like to avoid personal accountability. They don't like the personal eh, finger on them that they're not good. Okay? All right? But we see grief. It grieved him. Okay? And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Grieved him. Okay? Grieved him. First appearance of these words of repent in any variation right there. Okay? We see it associated with grief. But verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Favor. So we see grief. And hey, free gracers, just believe and receive. I don't have, not to admit, yeah, you should, should, you know, change a little bit. But don't worry, just believe and go on your merry way. Talk like the world, act like the world, use the world's things to your advantage to attack other people. You know, there's no, where's the, where's the brokenness? Where's the suffering before the glory? Huh? You're offering a gospel with no death. Now, you'll be like, gospel, death? Uh, the way of the cross, okay, the cross is death. There has to be a death before you can be born again. Something has to die in order to become a new creature. Okay, hello. But no, they're not that bad stuff. It's a work anyway. Just believe. And they make these people twofold more the child of hell than themselves. And they laugh <laughs> all the way at it. It's very dangerous. I would say it's, a, it's more dangerous than Calvinism, actually. I would. Because according to the free gracer, right? If anybody at any time, had a belief in Jesus Christ, like stupid head, uh, Christy Burke, a free gracer, to protect their ridiculous doctrine, they would have to say, she's saved. 
have you actually sat and listened to that little stupid head? That, that little girl, she's not saved. She's not saved. Well, she believed. The devils also believe. And then watch the gymnastics. Okay? Uh, Ezekiel. Oh, you can't get away from this topic without going to Ezekiel at least once. Okay? Ezekiel 14, verse 6. Just one verse to start here. Verse 6. Now, first appearance of repent. We see it associated with grief. The free grace gospel, there's no grief. There's no suffering. None. It's all believe and receive. Okay? Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, verse 6 in Ezekiel 14, Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Dispensational difference here. Okay, difference here. The idols, though, and you atheists are a perfect example of this and some with these Christians. You are your own idol. You are your own God. Okay? You decide what is right and wrong. You are your, perf you are your own standard. Hence, okay? But, Again, today in this dispensation, you know, you can't repent of your sins and be saved. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it if I put a shotgun at your head. You couldn't do it. The repenting is being grieved and turning from what? Your self-righteousness that you're a good person. That's what they avoid. And that is what is needful. Okay? That is what is needful. Hey, come here. That's a requirement. Oh. And they, 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 your backloading works until salvation. Um, no, you don't keep the law today to be saved. Okay? Remember, the works that are talked about, uh, that Paul talks about, are the works of the law. Okay? All right? Ezekiel 18. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know their heart. This person has just done everything contrary to Scripture. But because they say a professor belief, you as the free grace of well, I, I don't know. Um, I believe the Scripture, that you need to be broken of your self-righteousness, contrite, Fear the Lord and call upon his name. Oh, you're a lost heretic. They say that to us. But yet someone who is obvious, this like, well, I don't know their heart. Dude, you, I don't know how you tolerate those people. I really don't. I really don't. I really don't. But Ezekiel 18, verses 30 on to verse 32. Therefore will I judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn. Yes, repentance involves turning. Repentance first and foremost is grief. Grieve. Okay? Scripturally. Okay? There is no grief in the free grace gospel. Of course people are going to like that. What, 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 you mean I don't have to, don't have to be? No, don't worry about it. Just believe and believe and receive. Okay, sure, I'm in. So I don't have to give up like the Hollywood movies or even my foul language because I I heard you be using it. I think, we shouldn't, but don't worry about it. You believe and receive. Don't worry about it. You're eternally secure. Making false converts. Making false converts. Okay? Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. I said it like that purposely, chill. Okay? Now, again, today, you, you can't turn from all your iniquities. You couldn't do it. Different dispensation. We're looking at it for the word repent. We see grieve and turning. Again, there's no grief. In the free grace gospel. None. And all the teachers of this stuff. Look at them. There are 
some I respect. There's, there's a guy in Canada who um, I, I actually do respect. I don't like him. He don't like me. He's lost. He called me lost. But I have respect for him at least. Okay? But the majority of these people that you will run into, they're... Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart. You don't make your new. You don't make a new heart in you today. You can't. Okay, this was a different dispensation. See, today when you come to the Lord on His terms and He saves you and seals you, you are a new creature with the Lord in you. Okay, hence, hence, new creature, and a pure heart is a broken contrite heart that belongs unto the Lord. Okay? New creature, get it? Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. He delighteth in mercy. Absolutely. Saith the Lord God, wherefore, turn, repent yourselves and live ye. But repentance is work. Prayer is work. Calling on the name of the Lord is work. No, it's not. That's the requirement for today. And see, if you were broken, brought to your destruction, brought to your death of your pride. Well, Brad, you talk about you have a pride problem. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I still struggle with it because my spirit and soul are housed in this, where sin is. Okay? But see, the Lord lives in me. I'm sealed until the day of redemption. The Lord is there to be like, Brad, you better watch it. Or I'm going to act this up on you. I have a heart condition. Okay? I've got really bad arteries. If I don't watch it, I have a wife who will correct me. I have brethren who correct me. Okay? You don't see the chastisement. You don't see the actual hammer. But the result, the end of that chastisement, I've seen this in my brother. Like I said, the sweetheart brother of ours um, recently who went through some changes in his life, which were for his betterment. I have seen, heard the fruit unto righteousness that come from the chastisement of the Lord. Okay? All right? False converts don't have that. But God, right there, turn, repent, live ye. Okay? All right? Now, one of the things, <laughs> this is so, and to this very day, oh, to this very day, Acts chapter 8, okay? Like I said, the free grace, easy believism guy has to, has to, when someone professes a belief in Jesus, they, according to their doctrine and their agenda, and what is their agenda? They don't write like they about the, the, these. I don't. I can't honestly remember if I've ever encountered a free gracer who truly rightly divides. There are some of these free gracers who call themselves dispensational, but yet they say it's by grace through faith from the beginning. <laughs> That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. Salvation changes in the dispensation. Okay? That's what makes a dispensation different. Salvation changes. Okay? So, when they say they're dispensational, but yet they say it in the garden, it's by grace through faith, but you're not dispensational. So shut up. Okay? So, I don't think I have ever encountered a free gracer who is actually rightly dividing the word of truth. How I mean, if you're saying that it's by grace through faith in Genesis and Garden of Eden, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. You're not dispensational. So no, I mean, like I said, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't. Because uh, I've, I've encountered quite a few. Okay? Quite a few. And listen, if you're an adherent of free grace yourself, Examine yourself. <laughs> okay? Examine yourself. Truly. 
But, like I said, the free grace, they, they would be go as far as to say like, okay, let's say Gandhi. <laughs> Love the sinner, hate the sin. Yeah. Um, Gandhi, who could have professed faith in Christ. Well, if he, he professed, he said he believed, he believes he's in heaven. Are you nuts? Are you nuts? <laughs> You're crazy. Gandhi saved. <laughs> well, he believed. See, see how ludicrous that is? Well, you don't know their heart. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But see, Acts chapter 8. This, this, this is, this, I, I, I don't know how any of these guys can do this with a straight face. I really don't. I really don't. Because it's right here. Shimon the sorcerer was dethroned because God came to town, as it were. And he was envious, and he wanted his position back. Verse 13 on verse 24. Then Shimon himself believed also. And see, these free gracers say that this guy was saved. They do, because he believed. They say that. They're nuts. They're lying to you. I'll prove it. No, I won't. The scriptures will. Let's go. Then Shimon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, you water dogs, he was even baptized. Oh, double. He's reinforced, right? Double, huh? He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Shimon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Shimon bewitched the people with sor sorcery, and he gave out himself that he was some great one. That he was like the great power of God. Well, God came around. And Shimon was dethroned. It's like, you, you, dude, you're, you're full of it. That, that's what Philip is offering us. That's the true God. You, you get out of here. He was envious. He wanted his position back. He was, it was all about himself. Okay? Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. He wanted the power. Why? To benefit the Lord? No. To benefit only himself. Okay? Oh, self-righteousness? Okay? Like I said, I don't know how some of you free gracers with a straight face can deceive people. Well, because people don't know the word of God. Right? And the King James, it's the best, but it's not perfect, right? I prefer the New American Standard or the... Shut up. <laughs> but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be perfect, may be purchased, excuse me, with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. He didn't want, he didn't want to be saved. He didn't want to be close to God. He wanted the visual power to reclaim his position. He was never broken. Okay? Now, repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if, perhaps, the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And we already looked in Genesis chapter 6, the man's heart from his beginning is evil continually, okay? Every thought of the imagination of his heart is, or is wicked. We'll get to more of that, but let's keep reading. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness 
and in the bond of iniquity. Yeah, he lost his position. But Peter told him to pray to the Lord. I know of these devils who themselves don't pray. They don't pray because they're not saved. Okay? Here's proof that Shimon was not saved. Then answered Shimon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. You pray for me. I'm not going to pray. I don't want to pray. You pray for me. This man was saved and broken. And Peter said that. You go pray to him right now. Um, if he were truly a convert, he would have been on his knees like that. Going, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Make, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. That wasn't there. That wasn't there. Instead, you pray for me. People. Shimon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 was not a saved man. Never was. Okay? Yes, he believed. He was baptized. But he was never saved. Because he wasn't broken. He had no contrition. And he sure as Chadez had no fear of the Lord. He was never saved. Never. Never. To this day, to this day, the free grace, easy believism heretic must, in order to protect their deathless, well, they, they're about the death, uh, death uh, burial and resurrection of the Lord, yes, but death of self, there's no grief in their gospel. There's none. There's none. I hate to do this, but, um, you know, rock man with his power of negative thinking, okay? Uh, I tried reading that book, but I couldn't. I, I had to stop. But um, there's no negative. There's no negative in the free grace gospel. And the grace of God cannot be a glory unto you unless it is first the suffering. You have, something has to die for a new creature to be brought about. That's what they avoid, people. And this thing about the hard wall, I, I, I've, I've observed this wall. I'm not going to say they're lost. I don't know his heart. Well, I believe in scriptural repentance, brokenness, uh, brokenness, contrition, and calling upon the name of the Lord out of fear of him. Heretic! You're lost! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, up the dosage there, pal. Yeah, go ahead. Jeremiah 17. Verses 9 on to verse 11. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 on to verse 11. Okay? Jeremiah 17, verses 9 on to verse 11. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall he be a fool. And the fool has said in his heart, There is no God. This verse is beautiful because why? The free grace, easy believism heretic is offering you salvation, riches, without right. Without right. Without brokenness. Without contrition. Without the fear of the Lord and calling upon His name. They're offering you that without death of yourself. And that's not salvation. Salvation is brokenness contrition, and fear of the Lord calling upon his name. And any saint can tell you. It's not step one, step two, step three, are you saved, brother? No, it's not that. It happens like that. And see, so you don't get that. Because you're not saved. But misery loves company, right? And see, at their end, 
There shall be a fool, and the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are their own gods, because they save themselves by their own belief. It's actually a form of works, which they are so adamantly against. And of course, Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, verses 25 on to verse 26. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. I'm better than that guy. You think I'm lost and you think he's saved? I'm saved because I just believe. I cry, I called on the name of the Lord a hundred times. Were you ever broken? Well, I'm saved because I, 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 I will, I will, I will, I will. I will, man. Come on. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. What is a fool? What is a fool? Not with thee on the end. What is a fool? Oh, Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 on to verse 35. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 on to verse 35. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? You don't speak the true gospel. You have a gospel without death of self. Oh yeah, you talk about the death, burial, and resurrection, and the blood. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But see, you're removing the key components to salvation because you don't want any of it. And you're saving and you're taking it upon yourself by just believing. O ye generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Sooner or later, they always that always happens. Okay? That always happens. And, I mean, especially if you uh, observe some of these guys and just sit there and, you know, and you look at the, the thing going up, uh, the live chat or whatever, and people using profanity and calling each other brother and laughing at grotesque worldly things. And it's like... And these guys, most of these guys, you ask them, it's like, when did the New Testament begin? Oh, it began in uh, Nicaea, right? Oh, Catholic are you, huh? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Hmm. Peter talks about the hidden man of the heart. The hidden man of the heart is who? The Lord Jesus Christ. I think with a lot of these free gracer guys, the reason why they won't judge others who are obviously lost because they themselves are lost. Like I said, I don't believe a single one that I have encountered is saved. Not encountered, but, you know, I've observed, especially lately, I've seen way too many of them. And it's like, I don't think any one of them is saved. They're afraid to judge. But yet, they'll judge the saints as work salvationists and um, uh, um, Denlinger rights or what, la, what not like that nonsense that guy whatever but um, yeah listen listen to me can't be uh, fixed unless you're broken and if you have believed without any brokenness or contrition come let us reason together, you and I. 
Because this doctrine of the free grace that they preach unto you, skipping over, literally, skipping like a gazelle over repentance, over repentance, scriptural repentance, brokenness, contrition, and the fear of the Lord, and calling on His name, and calling those works, but just believe and receive? That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Oh yes, of course belief. Of course. But how do you attain to that belief? By being broken of your self-righteousness. Taking accountability, responsibility, because you put them on, on the cross. And having the hell scared out of you. And crying out unto the Lord for his mercy. For his forgiveness. That's going to be it for this video today. I, I do hope, I, I do hope, you dear people, I do hope you consider these things. Uh, I really do. Because um, <laughs> I, I've, I've been observing these free grace people. They're lost. The ones that I've been observing, they're all lost. There's no way. There's no way. Now, stupid head in the previous video, she's saved because she once had a belief and you listen to the blasphemy that comes out of that little girl's mouth and she's saved. Uh, you guys are the ones who do not understand re regeneration because you yourselves are not new creatures. What a shame. Because as we're going to touch on in one of these videos, Lord willing, this week, what would happen? We've talked about this before, but I, I want to go through this uh, again, but not today. We're, we're about done here. Uh, what would happen if one of these guys actually got saved? And the Lord started to use that individual for his glory. And all their talents that they're using for the devil, the Lord takes them and he starts applying those for the Lord. Wow! Wow! You know, some of you coadjutors, if the Lord would save you, again, the impossible is possible with God. But it's not at force. It's not force. And the probability of you being saved is it impossible? No. No, it isn't. That's not probable. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you for watching this if you do. We love you. Thank you. Tomorrow is the 15th. Uh, our brother Jeff, uh, he has given me permission to use his name publicly. Um, uh, it was a miscommunication between us on my part, and also his lovely Jesuit doctors who are very forthright. Um, he's not having surgery tomorrow, but he's going for the consultation. Please keep our brother Jeff in prayer. And please keep each other in prayer. Please keep us in prayer. We love you. See you in the next video. Boy, it's raining something good now. Bye-bye.